But there's something about Van Gogh's legacy which is much more important than his fathering this or that ism of modern art. Vincent's passionate belief was that people wouldn't just see his pictures, but feel the rush of life in them. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Well, today it is uh, the most authentic voice in true crime versus the art experts, the Van Gogh um, Museum kind of institution, all the, the sort of army of people associated with that huge multi-million dollar industry. And um, today I'm going to be taking that on. I'm going to be taking on their narrative. I didn't actually um, expect this Tree Roots story to, to come out right now. I did expect some kind of PR, I don't want to call it a stunt, maybe it is that, but some kind of PR extravaganza uh, coinciding with his death. I thought there would be something newsworthy coming out, um, but I certainly didn't expect a book and this sort of um, coordinated response around this uh, discovery of the tree roots. Bear in mind, the discovery actually happened months ago. It happened in, I think, March this year, and they've been holding it back until this moment. So uh, it, it's all been very carefully choreographed and, and arranged. So in this episode, we're going to go through the remainder of Adeline Ravu's letter, or his statement dealing with the um, circumstances of Van Gogh's death. This is a first-hand um, e e experience, or whatever. It's interesting that she's not quoted more often. Uh, what is also interesting is in Van der Fier's book, at the end is the original interview where you sort of hear the interviewer talking, where you see the reference to the interviewer and then the exact verbatim responses from Adeline Review, whereas this is a um, transcript, but without he said, she said. It's kind of a, an essay form of that conversation. Um, in Van der Fier's book, there's um, more a verbatim transcript. So we can also look at that. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through Adeline Review's uh, statement dealing with the death, and then I'm going to go to an art expert, and I'm going to talk a little bit about his opinion, and then I'm going to talk about my opinion. Um, I should tell you that I, when I went to Orvay last year, um, in towards the end of May uh, last year, I went there to not just to have fun. I went there to go and investigate a few um, theories. i would already written a book on Van Gogh and I wanted to do a couple of things. One of the things that I wanted to do was answer the question, where? Where did this happen? Where was he shot? Because it's a question that they don't know in or there and you never really hear anyone talking about it. Now, ironically, I went there and I asked questions. I asked people in some of the Van Gogh institutions like um, Gachet's house and also the Ravu Inn, the people working there, where, where do you guys think Vincent shot himself? And no one could answer. And I thought it was, don't you even have an opinion on that? And right now, all of this brouhaha about the tree roots is kind of saying, that's where it happened. That is where he was when he committed suicide. And I'm going to be debunking that. I'm going to be telling you that that is not only bunkum, it's just complete nonsense. 
Okay, so fasten your seat belts because things are going to tick up a couple of notches as we deal with this um, kind of, let's call it an extravaganza. It's so tragic because it's dealing with this gentle man, this, this um, so kind of sweet, kind Dutch artist who nevertheless had an intense side to him. And people have now you are using that to their own um, for their own ends. Anyway, let's go to Adeline Ravu. She says, "Here's what I know about his death. That Sunday. So first of all, it happened on a Sunday. Also, just that that simple comment, that simple factual, um, not admission, but but uh, acknowledgement." that this happened on a Sunday. Do you ever hear any art experts talking about that? Because what happens on a Sunday? What happens on a Sunday is that people don't, most people don't work. Van Gogh was working. This was quite a, as I said earlier, a um, religious or a very, like a Catholic enclave. So you can bet your bottom dollar that, that people there weren't working. So he was working, other people weren't working. What were other people doing? If Van Gogh was working and it was a Sunday, what do you think other people were doing on their day off? Do you think they could possibly have been drinking? We also know the weather conditions for that day, that it was really hot, it was unusually hot. And so you could have a situation where people are drinking refreshment, but you can also have a situation where Vincent himself having worked, been outdoors all day, is thirsty. And maybe someone invited him for a drink, a drink of water, right? Or, sorry, I've just gone for a walk myself. Or um, maybe a drink of something else. Just something to think about. These are not matters of dispute. This is not... Um, uh, conjecture, it's a fact. It was a hot day and it was a Sunday. So you're just putting those two facts together. Um, Adeline says he went out immediately after breakfast, which wasn't, uh, uh, which was unusual. So she says the fact that he went out immediately that day was a little bit strange. Now, one possibility for that is he could feel the heat of the day already. And either it was hot in his room or he wanted to get stuff done before it got too, too hot. So that's another possibility. Another possibility is that he was going to Dr. Gachet later on or he's going to somebody later on and he, he, for whatever reason he wanted to get what he needed done before that was happening. So in other words, he may have had an engagement that he knew about that night. Or that afternoon. Whatever it is, one kind of has the sense that he has something on his mind that day, that he wants to get something done. Now you might say, well, wasn't the suicide? Well, would you really go out and get a lot done before you go and commit suicide? You could maybe answer yes. On the other hand, why on earth would you paint something? Why wouldn't you write a letter to your brother? Why wouldn't you pack your bags? Why wouldn't you read the Bible? Why wouldn't you go to church? Why wouldn't you sit by the river? Or I don't know. Why wouldn't you talk perhaps to someone? So anyway, so he goes out uh, earlier than usual, immediately after breakfast, he gets an early start. And what is strange is that by dusk, he, he hasn't returned. So he leaves very early and then he's gone the entire day, right? And this is the surprise them because every other day that he, he would return on a normal time. She says he was extremely correct in his relationship with us. He was always, he always kept regular meal hours. We were then all sitting out on the cafe terrace for on Sunday the hustle was more tiring than on weekdays. So let's stop there for a second. Now I can sit here and 
speculate about what Ove or parts of France were like on a summer's day on a Sunday evening. And I just have. And here is Adeline telling you what to expect. And what she's telling you is um, there were people sitting out on the cafe terrace. So there were people sitting outdoors, sitting outside. And I experienced the same thing when I was there in late May. Is people are enjoying the summer air. They um, are enjoying being out at, at kind of at night, but sort of on the sort of patios and terraces. And she says, on a Sunday, the hustle was more tiring than on weekdays. What does that tell you? What are people doing on a Sunday? They are visiting restaurants. They are enjoying not working. There's a saying in Afrikaans, kairing, which means gathering. Um, uh, it's a little bit more than gathering. It's sort of partying or sort of enjoying yourself. You're usually with good food, uh, people around you, and often alcohol. So isn't that what was going on? So uh, Van Gogh is leaving early on that day, is going to work in an environment where other people around him are not necessarily working. In other words, they're casual. They are, uh, what's the word? They are, they have their guard down and they are kind of um, socializing, right? And you could also say, well, so on this day, everyone was with someone that they wanted to be with and he wasn't. His family wasn't with him. And that's why he committed suicide. On the other hand, you can say, didn't he socialize? Because he was socializing. He was socializing with the gachets. He wasn't socializing at the Revue Inn, but he hadn't socialized there all along. So where else would he socialize? Well, where else was he going to paint in the garden? Where else was he um, eating other meals? Where else did he have friends? Where else had he painted not just one, but three other people's portraits? Where? And where did he usually meet or when, what, what, we, what day did he usually hang out at Dr. Gachet? You think it was a weekday? I don't. So he goes on to say, she goes on to say, um, when we saw Vincent arrive, night had fallen. It must have been about nine o'clock. So that's, that's great. We actually get a timestamp for what time he arrives home, and it's nine o'clock. It's quite late. It's late on a Sunday night. Why did he wait the whole day to shoot himself? Was he not sure that he wanted to? Did he wake up that day and leave immediately, not knowing he's going to commit suicide? So at what point did he know? Did he know at eight o'clock? Did he suddenly just decide to do it, and then he sort of... Um, intentionally, purposefully shot himself badly. Does that make sense to you? He sort of had the whole day to commit suicide, and then when he does it, he's sort of, well, should I shoot myself in my head? No. Should I, shoot, should I shoot myself in the foot? Or does he just sort of grab a gun and very quickly, right? Now we're going to deal with the ballistics report, which rubbishes the suicide theory, by the way, just that on its own, just the ballistics report. This is uh, from a medical doctor, it's not me saying it's a medical doctor. So you've got that kind of level of forensic evidence saying, it doesn't really look like what people are talking about. It's a bit strange, it's not quite looking like what you guys are saying. And as we know in true crime, you want to look at things like that. Um, not necessarily an autopsy report, but a ballistics report from a medical doctor or a, examining the situation here and saying, hmm, this is my expert opinion of something very, something with legal repercussions, but something also with medical repercussions and, and sort of criminal evidentiary value. And of course, do you hear the art experts talking about that very much? We're going to look at what they do talk about. Um, so in any event, he arrives home quite late. Now, if, um, if I'm right, and he was at Dr. Gachet, doesn't that mean this incident where he got shot happened possibly sometime after dinner, possibly even sort of during dinner, 
but basically at the back end of dinner. In other words, if you went to dinner, maybe the dinner was at um, starting at, say, 5, 6, 7 o'clock, which means the dinner was fairly advanced when this happened. In other words, at least an hour or two, even three hours after or during dinner, this incident happens. Now, what is the incident? I mean, what is kind of going on here? Well, isn't it possible that he had dinner and they were drinking alcohol at dinner and the doctor Gachet more than likely had refined taste and maybe had wine and he offered Vincent some wine and Vincent may have felt well I, I kind of deserve a, a drink I think I deserve a you know I've, I've been um, sort of abstaining completely I think I need kind of a break and the doctor may have said to him as well oh man it's not so bad but the doctor may not have known about his previous difficulties with it. I don't know whether Theo would have told him. In any event, Vincent may have drank a little bit and gotten into an argument because of that. Now, I'm just saying that's one possibility. It's also a possibility that somebody else drank and he didn't drink. And 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 that also caused a problem is Vincent was completely sober and the person he was with wasn't. Or the person he was with wasn't sober and then sort of exited the room and then Vincent was then with another person thinking this other person who was no longer sober was out of the picture and then they returned. Another possibility. I think we are going to see, I think, um, what's her name, Adeline did say in a previous statement that, that she never saw him drunk. Now the question is, when he stumbled into the inn, could he have been drunk? Now I think if he was drunk out of his mind, someone would have smelled it, someone would have remembered it. But I don't think they did. On the other hand, he could have been, um, if he was somewhat drunk, him stumbling and holding himself over, that might disguise it. And also the blood may have kind of taken away any sense of, well, um, should I smell for alcohol kind of thing. Okay, so just it's important to bear that in mind. Um, so one thing I do want to talk to you about, I'm not sure if I'll, I'll have time to do it in this episode, but when I went to Orve, one of the things I wanted to examine is um, I wanted to walk the exact route from Dr. Gachet's house to the Revue Inn. I wanted to walk it myself, so I wanted to see how arduous it was. Because the castle is sort of almost halfway between these two points. And there's, there's, a, there's somewhat of an incline and then a downhill. And so I wanted to sort of imagine um, that he'd been shot, how far this walk was compared to other walks, and how long it would have taken, and I timed it as well. And the thing that occurred to me while I was doing this was thinking, well, you know, if you think, well, how far could he have walked? How far would have been too far? Um, and the fact that he was able to climb two stairs, two flights of stairs at the end of wherever he came from, tells you that he was capable of walking probably um, further than you might think. Now, now, a very important thing that I think um, you guys need to think about is, did Van Gogh walk along the ribbon of the town past people you know that were sort of sitting there or did he walk into the town from the outside at some point in other words was in the countryside and he sort of penetrated the fabric of the town perpendicularly and and then sort of just came in and then he was at the review in and i'll show you maps about this in a in another episode dealing with geography and topography um, but that's quite an important point. Was he walking along the, the fabric of the town, which is like spaghetti, or did he enter it from another angle, perhaps from the countryside? And these are really important questions because um, wherever this happened, you've got to say, well, why didn't you hear the gunshot wound? So, so, so why didn't you hear the gunshot? So for example, if he shot himself out in the country, you would sort of ask, well, with this flat expanse going on for miles and miles, are you telling me that 
nobody heard this crack on this completely open landscape, which which would have allowed that sound to go on for miles, literally. On a on a Sunday evening in the countryside, you would definitely hear a noise because you wouldn't have other things going on. People wouldn't be farming. Um, and then the flip side of, of that is um, dealing with the topography, the quite unique topography of um, of of Ove. And it kind of makes kind of like a horseshoe shape. And so this ridge line basically means if you're at a certain point, you might not hear a sound around another point. And that would explain why um, we, we know he was shot. The thing is why, does, why didn't anyone hear anything? And that is also going to tell you a little, about, a, a little bit about where he probably was. So we go on and we talk about, um, sorry, Adeline talks about um, it was nine o'clock. He walked bent, so he walked. He was holding his stomach and exaggerating his habit of holding one shoulder higher than the other. And then Adeline's mother said to him, Monsieur Vincent, we were anxious. We were happy to see you return. There's something wrong. And he replied in a voice that was sort of suffering. He was able to answer. It wasn't as though he was completely out of breath. He said, um, no, but I have, and then he didn't finish his sentence. Now, I think in the original interview, she says he says something like, no, but, and then he doesn't continue talking. Now, now why can't he just say what has happened to him? He's, arrived at the, at the inn and someone said, are you okay? What's happened? And he stops himself from answering. Why? And I can give you an answer. He's, he's probably thinking about what he's going to say. He's going to have to say something else other than what did happen to him. He's sort of arriving back and he's seeing these people and now he's thinking about things from a different perspective. What are these people going to think? What are these people going to say? What is his brother going to think? What is his brother going to say? And now he's going to think, well, what, what am I going to have to, what's the story going to have to be about what's happened here? So he doesn't tell them, and he's, he's not usually rude, he's, he's usually a nice person. And so he just walks by them. And he goes up the staircase to his bedroom. Now, that's another thing that I want to kind of emphasize is he had a doctor. He traveled to Auvers and he had a doctor. His doctor was his best friend. So here he is injured. Why is he not going to his doctor? Why is he going to lie on his bed alone and he's suffered a gunshot? Think about that for a second. Imagine you have a friend who's a doctor and he lives just down the road. Literally, he does. And you are not home. You're somewhere out on foot. And you suffer a gunshot wound. Right? It doesn't really matter how or who or what. Where do you go? Now, why does he go to his room? Now, you might say, because he wants to die. But then they do summon a doctor, and they also do eventually summon Dr. Gachet. So why not just go to the doctor? Well, I'll tell you one possible reason, is he was coming from the doctor. So the last place he wants to go is back to the doctor. And also, the last person the doctor wants to treat is Vincent van Gogh. And not surprisingly, when Dr. Gachet arrived, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, When um, Dr. Gachet arrives, he's not very nice to Vincent and he doesn't, he's not very helpful either. But let's get it from Adeline Revu. She says, um, Vincent made such a strange impression on us that father got up and went to the staircase to see if he could hear anything. 
He thought he could hear groans and then went up quickly and found Vincent on his bed, lay down in a crooked position, knees up to the chin, moaning loudly. And if you just think about that image of Van Gogh, he's sitting in his bed, almost like a child with his knees and his chin. Again, you can see it in two ways. You can see it as he's trying to kill himself, he's now in terrible pain, what now? What does he do now? The other one is, and this resonates with me, is that he's just had another horrible incident, in this case with Dr. Gachet, with his friend, his, his um, supporter, his doctor, a guy who's kind of doing networking for him, a guy who did an etching for him, which I think is a fraud anyway, but, and, and I think he's feeling a feeling of shame and embarrassment and grief and terrible anxiety. Like, what's going to happen now? Am I going to be able to carry on working? Am I going to be able to carry on living here? Am I going to survive this? One thing he's not doing is he's not screaming and he's not out of control. He's not... There's not tears coming down his face like someone who is so drunk with emotion and, and is completely calm. So do you think he was not rational when he committed suicide? Well, a lot of people say he was completely rational when he committed suicide. I, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know if when you commit suicide, you are completely rational. I think you're compromised you are compromised that there's absolutely no hope, absolutely no hope, not maybe a little bit of hope. You are convinced that there's no hope. Anyway, he goes on to say, sorry, she goes on to say, um, the innkeeper, Adeline's father said, what's the matter? And are you ill? And Vincent then lifted his shirt and showed him a small wound in the region of his heart. That's also quite interesting when the, when the innkeeper says, what's happened to you? Instead of saying anything, he sort of shows him. He lifts up his shirt and just shows him. And I, haven't, haven't you ever read a book? You're reading a book and someone says, so let's say you sort of reading a book, whatever. Someone says, what are you reading? And you, and you go like this and you sort of, and why do you do that? Because you don't really want to say something or you so deep in thought you're so deep inside the narrative that you kind of like, well, you know. And, and sometimes you ask someone, what are you reading? And, and they will look at the cover and they'll be like, oh, I'm reading that. But what I'm trying to get at is he doesn't want, I don't think he wants to say what has happened. And once again, you can argue it both ways. You can say he doesn't want to say what's happened because he's embarrassed about what he did. I think he is embarrassed about what he did. I think he's embarrassed about what has happened. Anyway, let's go on. Um, she says, Father cried, unhappy man, what have you done? And then he said, I have tried to kill myself. And that is the biggest obstacle to deal with if you're going to make the argument that he was murdered. And the argument is, why on earth would he say, the counter argument is, why would he say I'd try to kill myself if he didn't? Any ideas? Why would he say he cut off his ear? Or he didn't say cut off his ear, but why would he say cut off his ear if he didn't cut off his ear? And the short answer to that is that's the kind of person he was. He was very self-deprecating when it came to something like this. He, he could at the same time be irritating and infuriating, but at the same time he could be incredibly, he could take a lot upon himself. His entire trip to saint Rami was him saying, there's something wrong, I'm sorry, and admitting himself to this asylum, and he goes there for a year. He volunteers to go to the asylum for a year, and then he admits himself out and he's not as sick as everybody else. That's something he took on himself. The ear thing 
is also something he kind of took on himself and then he goes and gives the ear to a prostitute. He almost bleeds to death on that occasion. Um, I can take it so far back into his, his sort of history where he um, works in the Borinage for very little pay. He, 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 he suffers on purpose because that's what he sort of wants to do. And here his reasons are very good. He's trying to protect actually his brother. His brother's life is hanging in the balance in terms of his work and everything. And, and if it turns out that he's now embarrassed his brother again, I'm talking about by being shot by Dr. Gachet, and there's like a court case and, and a scandal. He's thinking, I can minimize this if I just take it on myself. I did it, no one else. Don't talk to anyone else, it's just me. Leave him out of it, leave my brother out of it, just just, just leave it alone. And that's exactly what he says to the police. So, Adeline says these words are precise. That's exactly what he said. He said, I tried to kill myself. Now, have you ever heard, have you ever heard a suicide note? Have you ever heard someone like, um, if someone didn't write a suicide note, have you ever heard someone who committed suicide saying, I committed suicide? No, because most people don't survive suicide to say it, but, it, but Vincent did. So here yeah, he's saying, I tried to kill myself. Where's the gun? If he had the gun and he tried to commit suicide, where's the gun? Why didn't he finish what he was doing? I mean, he wants to ki kill himself. Why didn't he do it? And why is he now in his bed? Like, that's not the best place to successfully commit suicide once you're injured. Anyway, she goes on to say, um, Our father retold the story many times to my sister and I because our, fa our family and the tragic death of Vincent van Gogh has remained one of the most prom prominent events of our life. And do you know why? The fact that it was said that this guy had committed suicide and then he died in the end meant that, that they couldn't hire that room out anymore. There was like a scandal that surrounded the Ravu Inn. And they could never recover from it and, and the family eventually left. So it did have a huge impact on, on them, this, this story. A friend of mine's coming here in about half an hour to just help me with my computer. And so I just sort of feel like I'm worrying about that the whole time, worrying about the time. It's not the best situation. Anyway, um, she goes on to say, I want to clear up any doubt about the fidelity, the reliability of my father's memory, which was prodigious. He sometimes told clients of our cafe his memories of the war of 1870. That was 20 years prior to what happened to Van Gogh. This was brought to the knowledge of a chronicler of blah, blah, blah. So she's just talking about how reliable whatever her father said was. She says the value of father's testimony is being well established. I continue the account of his memories on the death of the great painter. I must confess that the manner in which some biographers have spoken to me of father has shocked me. Father was not a vulgar man. His reputation of honesty was proverbial. He was not called father revu for nothing. He commanded respect. I continue there for the account of the confidence that, so even she is complaining about what has been said about these people. She goes on to say, Vincent, now this is really important. She says, Vincent had gone to the wheat field where he had painted previously. It was situated behind the Orvège Chateau and then belonged to Mr. Gozelin, who resided in Paris. The chateau was more than half a kilometer from our house. This is really, really important because what is being revealed here, I said it earlier, on what side of the Ravu Inn was Vincent van Gogh? Was he on this side, going along the fabric of the town? Or was he on that side, going along the fabric of the town? Or was he kind of behind it? Was he like in the countryside? 
Now, where the chateau is, is towards uh, Dr. Gachet's home. It's about halfway to his home. And immediately uh, behind the chateau are wheat fields. And so you can actually assume that both are true, that he went to the wheat fields, but when he came back, maybe he came back via Dr. Gachet, that he went there after he painted. Does that make sense? Also, if you look at a lot of the paintings that on the list of paintings of from Auvers in July, they are pictures of the church with wheat fields in between. So it kind of makes sense that he was painting the wheat fields, right? In fact, the chronology of the this, this sort of list of Van Gogh works puts the tree roots, which I'll talk about probably in the next episode, which everyone's going crazy about. He painted the tree roots. The tree roots is actually like a suicide painting. It's like, I am seeing roots and dark roots going like this. I, it's the end. Of, uh, it's the end. I'm, this is my suicide note. Well, was he that bad at writing and also that bad at painting? If now it's not crows in the wheat field, now it's roots. So, anyway, we now know on what side it is. Uh, it's difficult to know what to make of this because some of this information is coming from Dr. Gachet's son. Subsequently, the story was that Dr. Gachet's son said, well, that was where Vincent was, behind the chateau. And as I said, the chateau is not far from the Gachet home. It's in that direction from the Revue Inn. It's on the same road. Anyway, um, she goes on to say the chateau was more than half a kilometer from her house. Yes, that's true. And Dr. Gachet's house was another half a kilometer approximately further. She goes on to say it was shaded by large trees and there's a steep hill there. And we do not know how far he got from the chateau. And in the course of the afternoon on the road that passes under the chateau wall, so my father understood, Vincent shot himself with a revolver. So all of this is kind of giving you an idea of that's why you didn't hear the shot, because there was like a wall there and there were a lot of trees and, and, and it was on this sort of, this 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 ridge. It's on like, like, like a promontory. That's why you didn't hear it, because of the topography. And, and because he was behind this huge castle. Uh, I've actually put a picture of the castle in my slideshow yesterday, quite a nice one. And according to them, he shot himself actually quite early in the afternoon and then lost consciousness. And then he regained consciousness, but then couldn't find the revolver and then went. Does that make any sense to you? He shot himself in the outdoors and, and his, his gun and his art stuff has just disappeared. And then he, he decides to go home. Why doesn't he go to Dr. Gachet? Dr. Gachet from the castle is about the same distance from from um, from where he is to the Revue Inn. So why not go to the doctor? And and even if the doctor is not there, he's going to get better treatment there than in this horrible little tiny room, you know, kind of above a restaurant where there's sort of revelry and people drinking. Why does he go and seek medical treatment? I mean. He's, let's say, shot himself, he lies, he doesn't die. And what's he going to do now? If he wanted to die, why not just continue lying there? Just stay there, just stay where he is. The fact that he gets up and goes home is already showing he wants to live, and you're going to see that he does want to live. Anyway, he goes on, she goes on to say, Vincent shot himself with a revolver and fainted. Uh, the freshness of the evening revived him. That's apparently the story that he told. Um, there's no explanation here where the revolver come, comes from. Adeline doesn't say it's my father's. Vincent doesn't say it's Dr. Gachet's or her father's. It's just, it's just not disclosed. Where did Vincent get this revolver from? It's because it's not his and he didn't buy it. So where did he get it? That's quite, quite an important question, is where would 
a revolver like that be easy, more easily found? At a military doctor's home or at an innkeeper? So according to this, Vincent gave up looking and then came down the hill to regain a house. I think that's kind of a fanciful story Vincent himself said. Where were you while I was at the castle? Yeah, you were at the castle, Dr. Gachet's castle, which is also high up kind of on a hill. There's also a hill behind it. There are also wheat fields behind his home. She goes on to say, I never obviously assisted at the agony of Van Gogh, but I was witness to most of what happened, which I'm going to relate now. After seeing his injury in the region of the heart, far, far, it's not really in the heart, but father descended rapidly from the bedroom where Vincent groaned and he asked Tom Hershik, that's that other Dutch artist, who was probably downstairs socializing, to go in search of a physician. So her father says, go and get a, go and get a doctor. And guess what? There was a physician from Pontoise who had appeared at Tia. Um, this physician was absent. So the first doctor he goes to isn't Dr. Gachet. Are you telling me Tom didn't know about Dr. Gachet? Are you telling me he just had no idea about Dr. Gachet? Bear in mind, Tom's getting art supplies and he's being supported by Theo. Where do you think... When Vincent goes to Dr. Gachet, what do you think he says? Do you think he says, well, I'm just going somewhere? Or do you think he said, yeah, no, I went to Dr. Gachet today? When he's working on an etching or a, the painting of Dr. Gachet or um, a picture, a painting that is in a garden, do you think he says, yeah, well, that's Dr. Gachet? Are you telling me Tom didn't know about that? So why doesn't Tom go to Dr. Gachet first? I think as Tom was aware that there was enmity between Vincent and Dr. Gachet that they'd argued fairly recently. And maybe he was then invited back for dinner, maybe by Marguerite or maybe by the doctor, or maybe by Marguerite thinking the doctor wouldn't be home. Or maybe the doctor invited him and they argued again. Father sent then, Father sent Tom after that to Dr. Gachet, who resided in the upper part of the town, but did not practice in Auvergne. And, and then um, Adeline says, what was Dr. Gachet's connection with Van Gogh? Father ignored him completely. The physician had never come to the house and the scene in which my father's sister did not make him suppose any existed. In fact, on the contrary, she doesn't, have, she doesn't say very nice things about him. Why not? Her father doesn't seem to like him either. Why not? Now listen to this. This is, this is really, really important. Because now we're talking about Dr. Gachet. I'm not talking about him. These people are talking about him. After the physician's visit, father told us, these are Adeline Revue's father's words. Dr. Gachet has examined Mr. Vincent and has dressed his wound with bandages that he had himself brought. Someone had warned him that it concerned a casualty. He judged the case hopeless and left immediately. This is Sunday night. He, he was shot, I think, around about 8 or 9 o'clock. Van Gogh's even sort of hiding that aspect. Anyway, I think he was shot between 8 and 9 o'clock. The doctor arrives that same night... And even though Van Gogh lives another 25 hours, a, a, an entire day, he says, oh, no, no, it's hopeless. There's nothing you can do. I'm not going to try and do anything. I'm going to be a miserable, hopeless, pathetic doctor, even though I'm actually employed to look after this guy. And the fact that he's committed suicide, supposedly, shows I have failed spectacularly in my care as a doctor. And here I am to deal with that failure. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do nothing. I'm not going to sit at his bedside. I'm not going to try and comfort him or give him anything. I'm going to come and go and good luck to you. Now, doesn't that confirm something was going on between them? And that something had just happened with him, with them. 
he judged the case hopeless and left immediately. I'm absolutely certain that he did not return. He never came back. He had the whole day, the next day, to come back. How is Vincent? What has happened since I left? Is he alive as he died? How, what, how's his condition? He doesn't come back. Well, you're a doctor. You're, not a, you're a doctor and a friend. Why don't you come back? He didn't come back again that evening or the next day. She says that. And that must have surprised him. You send for the doctor, now must you send for him again? Or is he going to just sort of, well, you know, someone with a gunshot wound, someone who's been at my house often, my friend, oh, and I'm just, I've got other stuff to do. I've got to make a barbecue. I've got, um, I'm, I'm working on a little painting myself. Father told us again during, listen to this, and this is emphasized. Father told us again during the examination and when he was bandaging the wound, Dr. Gachet did not say a word to Vincent. That's not, that's not something I'm saying. It's what Adeline Ravu is saying her father said. And I think that is huge. I think that is huge, huge, huge. Um, I'm not going to actually take it further than this because I want to deal with the idiotic uh, art experts. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to do deal with that now. Um, but obviously, you can see why there's reason to be suspicious about Dr. Gachet. Makes no sense that under these circumstances, he wouldn't talk to Vincent. He wouldn't comfort him. He wouldn't ask him how he is. He would just sort of come in silently, do whatever he needed to do, and then leave. And isn't that the kind of that kind of silent treatment both ways? Isn't that the kind of thing you'd expect if there'd just been a violent argument and perhaps with Vincent trying to run away or squirming out of a chair, being shot? And now they've got nothing to say to each other. It's not just that Dr. Gachet doesn't say anything to Vincent. He doesn't say anything. Vincent van Gogh doesn't say anything to the doctor either. Oh, thanks for coming. Oh, um, yeah, no, I've just not been feeling very happy. Oh, you know, that treatment you gave me, that, that's, that's going to make me feel better. It didn't really work. Oh, maybe I should paint another painting to deal with my depression. That, because that was his treatment. How should I treat with... Treat my ailment. No, I think you should go out and paint a lot. Oh, okay. Should I paint now? Maybe that will help me survive this bullet wound. So now I'm going to quickly take you through an article. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to refer to this person's name, but I will put a link in the description so you can see exactly who it is. And But this guy is a... Van Gogh Big Shot, he's written many books about him and you could rightfully say, well, um, you've only written one book. This guy's written, say, four or five books. Well, I can tell you something. This guy doesn't know snuff about crime. This guy doesn't know snuff about criminal law and evidence and that kind of thing. Um, and I've written more than 90 books about crime and I've set in court where the court case is about did this person commit suicide or were they murdered? I'm not joking. I've sat in a court case where the case is about is this suicide or murder? I've written two books about one particular case where is it suicide or murder? Rebecca Zahal. And that is why I've navigated these straits between is there a stronger case for the motive to murder yourself compared to the motive someone else may have had to murder. And are you telling me this art expert has ever even thought in that direction? Has he ever actually had that thought in his mind? I don't think so. And I can tell you all of these art experts, Van der Fien as well, they are all like this little merry-go-round. The one says someone something, the other one recycles it, and they all support each other, and they're all part of the Van Gogh Museum. And, and then another artwork comes out, and it's worth millions, and they come and come to the auction and whatever. It's a big um, money-making sort of little circus, right? 
And the more that it's Van Gogh is troubled artist and is mad, the, the more these artworks are worth. And so when this th thing came out, again supporting that he committed suicide, but now we know exactly what happened. We know exactly which painting he painted, and we know his exact state of mind and what he's trying to communicate. Um, this same art critic jumps on that and says, yes, there we go. Immediately, his article comes out like, like it was, he was pre-given this information before it was released everywhere, right? So I'm just going to go through this guy's article. Um, he's a long, he, he describes himself as a long-standing correspondent and expert on the artist. Um, and he's done meticulous investigations about Van Gogh. Meticulous, it's, it's meticulous. And so this is article, Van Gogh's suicide, 10 reasons why the murder story is a myth. Wow. Ten. Ten reasons why it's a myth. Okay. Um, and then under that he says, all the evidence suggests it was the artist who fired the fatal shot. Wow. All, all, the, all the evidence. Wow. That's, that's quite a lot of evidence. So instead of giving three reasons or five reasons, he's giving us ten reasons. So let's go through those ten reasons. Um, he starts off through that, you can kind of read that yourself, but he says, in the beginning he was asked, why did Van Gogh cut off his ear? And um, I would love to just sit there hearing, oh, uh, why did he cut off his ear? Well, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then, did he commit suicide or was he actually murdered? That's the question that's not come up. So people have been asking him questions, and now he's sort of dealing with it here. He sort of tries to rubbish um, Knife and Smith, and Knife and Smith are coming up more and more and more often. He also talks about um, how the murder theories um, uh, taken up in different films, like Loving Vincent in 2017, three years ago, and At Eternity's Gate. So mainstream movies are, are acknowledging this thing that he says isn't true, right? Big actors like Willem Dafoe, um, and there are also some really well-known actors in Loving Vincent as well. So, and this is what he says, I remain convinced that the traditional view that Van Gogh shot himself is correct. He wasn't killed by sacred time. Well, I agree with that. He wasn't killed by sacred time. The murder story is yet another myth that has been added to those which have come to surround the artist. And then he says, here are 10 reasons why it's suicide. And this is, this is awesome. The number one reason, you know, like his number one top reason why Vincent van Gogh committed suicide. Are you ready for this? It's because his doctor said so. Guess who? Dr. Paul Gachet said, yeah, I think it's suicide. Started telling people it was a suicide. In the Rebecca Zahal case, guess who was saying that Rebecca Zahal committed suicide? The person implicated in her murder. In the Jason Roder case, guess who was saying that his wife committed suicide? The man implicated in her murder. And here you have this odd expert listing as number one, the doctor implicated in a murder who's saying, well, he's, an ex he's a doctor, why would he lie? He's a doctor. Just like the McCanns, why would they lie? They're doctors. Doctors don't lie. Doctors don't need to cover anything up. I mean, isn't there that doctor in England who's the most, the worst serial killer in British history? Because doctors don't lie. They, they, you can rely on them, they're honest. Just like art experts. And... I love how he says Dr. Gashad inspected the wound and spoken with Vincent, really. you saying he spoke with Vincent, but Adeline Ravu is saying that he didn't, and that, that, that is weird. But you saying that he did speak to Vincent. Had there been anything to suggest foul play, he would have presumably not let the matter rest, really. If there had been foul play and it had been his foul play, 
who they have later met a wrist. Um, Theo believed it was suicide. That's a better argument, certainly. Theo believed it was suicide. Well, Theo, do you think Theo would have wanted to put his hand up and say, hey, my brother had an argument with Dr. Gachet, the respected Dr. Gachet, the wealthy Dr. Gachet who buys so much art. Do you think he would want to say that to his bosses, given the precariousness of his job, which is have his brother just exit out of the whole thing? Exit out. I mean, his brother's not selling anything. So just, you know, who would you rather lose? Your brother who's not selling anything. I'm talking about in a pure money sense. Your brother who's not making anything or this client, this doctor client who buys a lot of artwork and so on, who's connected. And we need to talk about when Theo arrives and what they do and, and you know, what, what is really interesting is how long it took Theo to get there. Because guess what? Dr. Gachet was, was appointed by Theo to take care of, of him, right? So when something does happen to Vincent, why doesn't Dr. Gachet take Vincent to Paris, to a hospital there? Take him there. It's a, Paris is an hour away. There are great hospitals there. Why does he write a letter to Theo instead of sending him a telegram or going to him or, or sending his son or daughter to, to go and speak to Theo? Why does he not just, why does he do nothing with Vincent but he also doesn't make any effort to let his brother know? Why does Vincent say this guy's not to be trusted? So this is how ridiculous this guy's arguments are. First of all, why did this is the evidence now that that Vincent van Gogh committed suicide? His doctor believed it was suicide. Theo believed it was suicide. His friends believed it was suicide. Well, I've, I've heard the word belief three times in a row. When you go to a court case and you say, what happened here? Well, I believe that, I believe this, I believe that. That's not evidence. That is the... Um, per view of art experts. I believe this about this painting. I believe that's a nice color. That doesn't belong in a courtroom. It doesn't belong in true crime, I believe. We want to look at evidence. Paul Gauguin believed it was suicide. That's now how many in a row? The police believed it was suicide. This is now just too stupid to even interrogate one by one. So they believe, they believe, they believe. That's not evidence. The church believed it was suicide. This is not a bad one. Vincent had tried to kill himself the year before. We, we can talk about that. Um, I think Vincent wasn't very happy at saint Jaime. I'm not sure if there was actually a suicide attempt. I know something about eating paint. But, um, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. Um... Vincent faced a difficult, this is, this is really good, number eight, uh, Vincent faced a difficult time in the final, you kind of get the idea that this art expert's struggling a little bit towards the end to, to find things, but anyway, he, he says, Vincent faced a difficult time in the final months of his life, really, so in June and July, it was actually a harder time than when he was at saint Jaime. that's not my impression, reading the letters. From, from his own words, it seems like things were going well with Vincent. He didn't have an incident. Final months or final few days. I mean, what's this thing about the final months of his life? Things weren't going well. And here it is. He was worried about Theo's recent problems at work. That's why he committed suicide. That's why he, he committed suicide to not worry his brother. His brother had to now immediately pay for a funeral. He didn't want to upset his brother with more demands for art, so he committed suicide. Yeah, that makes sense. You think Van Gogh was either that stupid or someone who thought in such a fragmented way. Now, if I commit suicide, I'm not going to be a problem to my family. And this is why I say these people... 
project this onto him and they think, yeah, no, that makes sense. It makes that madness makes sense to him. But they don't think whether it makes sense to themselves, but it doesn't make sense. Um I should spend a little bit more time on this, but it really isn't really worth dealing with. I mean, if you guys have any questions, I can deal with them on any of these 10 points. If there's anything you want me to debate in detail, I can. Um, Rene Secretan, that's true. Um, he's not, and that is why Knife and Smith are also wrong. I don't agree with them either. I agree with Knife and Smith that there's no evidence that he committed suicide, but I don't agree with them that it was an accidental shooting. Uh, that's almost as ridiculous. Um, I think one of the dumbest things probably in this whole list is, um, it's written here, the recent emergence of the gun is further evidence for suicide. Wow. So the, the, the fact that they found the gun means it was suicide. <laughs> How does finding the gun mean that this is suicide? And... Not only that, it doesn't actually mean anything. The fact that the gun was found in around about 1960 by a farmer means that something was found in a field. You know, if somebody dies in the city where I live and 50 years later they find a gun, it doesn't mean that it's, it doesn't mean that that gun killed this one person. It means a gun was found in the area many, many years later. Now forensics work is you could take that gun and maybe it's corroded or rusted and you could do an X-ray of Van Gogh's coffin or his skeleton and try to match the ballistics of the two. And, and probably because of the passage of time, you wouldn't be able to. You can't say because there's uncertainty, this is a match and it, it's, got to be, it's got to be the same thing. You can't do that. I think his point is that... Um, because it was found in the field, um, if Van Gogh had pulled the trigger, he would have dropped the gun right there, and, and that's why it was found there. That, that's why the gun in the field has got to be the... But, you know, if you go and study your history, there was the First World War around about 30 years later. Or they sort of lay on that front. Okay, I am keep getting alerts from my phone that I've reached the falsa, so I'm not going to take this any further than that. I will leave you with a slideshow of photos I've taken with my cell phone inside the Revue Inn and other photos of France. I will continue uh, this analysis, especially of the tree roots, um, on Patreon on the $3 tier. So if you're interested, uh, head on there. I'm not going to continue this on YouTube. Those who follow this for as long as you have, thank you for, for listening. If you want to... Um, Okay, so if you want to um, reward me or give me something in return for my coverage of this case or whatever, you're welcome to give my book to somebody else if you, haven't, if you have read it or uh, buy it yourself. I recommend the Kindle version. I think the, the book is 10 times better than the narrative that I've sort of put together just on video. But if you do want to do something like that and you don't want to join Patreon, just, just buy the book gift it to someone. Uh, otherwise, if you don't wish to do that, um, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this series and um, I'll see the rest of you on Patreon on the $3 tier. Thank you for listening.